Good morning, and thank you for joining us. If you're new to Dungeness Community Church, we would love to connect with you. One way to connect is to text just the word hello to 360-683-7333, and we'll get you plugged in. Beginning September 13th, we're going to be offering an in-person Sunday service at 9 a.m. Seating is limited, so you'll need to register. Just go to our website at dcchurch.org and click the banner. Sunday services will continue to be available online and on DVD. This week is our fall kickoff and groups are getting started again. The following ministries are beginning this week. Women's Bible study, men's Bible studies, and grief share. Next week, our youth groups will start. The high school will be meeting on Sunday nights. There's a new young adults group meeting on Monday nights, and the middle school will be meeting on Tuesday nights. Please note that the days for the middle school and the young adults group has changed. For more information on any of these ministries, go to our website at dcchurch.org or call us in the office at 360-683-7333. And now it's time for Pastor Britt with the Kids Chat. Good morning, DCC Kids. It's hard to believe, but this is our last time talking about the letter from James. Rather than focus on the final seven verses of his letter, I want to finish up with something James wrote in chapter 5, verses 7 to 12. Pastor Tim taught on these verses at the summer celebration last weekend. One of his main points had to do with patience. Patience is a big idea in these verses and is one of the best ways we put feet to our faith. Verse 8 says, You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Can you think of something that captures the idea of being patient and standing firm? For me, I think of a lighthouse. Take a look at this picture. Now, this lighthouse is beautiful and solid, but it's not needed much when things are calm. No, lighthouses do their best work when things are stormy. This second picture captures what James is encouraging his readers to do in chapter 5, verse 8. We know the people reading James' letter were in the midst of hard times. It was difficult being a follower of Jesus in those days. Not only was Christianity a new thing, the government of Rome controlled much of their lives, and Rome was not excited about what J Jesus had started with the church. We've been talking about feet to faith the whole summer. Early on, James wrote the big idea of his letter. Don't just listen to the word of God and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. That's James chapter 1, verse 22. And most often, doing involves action. But here in chapter 5 is a picture of faith at work by just standing firm through patience. You probably remember James talked a lot about wisdom earlier in his letter. But Jesus also gave us a picture of wisdom. It's in Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. Here's what he said. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rains came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Yep, just like James, Jesus teaches us that wisdom means not just listening to his words, but putting them into practice, especially when there is stormy weather in our lives. Jesus is the rock we build on to be patient and stand firm. With all of the strange things going on with school this fall, I know you all have challenging things. Storms you're facing, weird routines, disappointments in many directions. James has given us a bunch of super practical ways to put feet to our faith, especially in challenging times. Things like controlling our tongues, like showing mercy to others, like being rich in good deeds, and generous with our stuff, like being patient. I hope you've been inspired to take what you've been listening to in the Word and begin doing what it says. Remember, there are always people paying attention to how we live. Doing what the Word says is one of the most powerful ways you make Jesus famous to others. Parents, 
Take a few minutes to look back over James with your kids and identify one of those practical feet to faith actions that is meaningful to them. Then help them to consider what it looks like to practice that particular thing this coming week. Kids, it's been great being with you to talk about James. We're working on some ways to bring you God's word this fall that I think you'll enjoy, so stay tuned. Most of all, it will be my joy to see you again in God's good timing when we're able to gather at DCC for church. Until then, stand firm, be patient, and keep putting those words of Jesus into practice. He is worth it. Bye. Good morning, church. We're so glad you joined us today. Yes. Isaiah 12, 2 says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid, for the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Let's turn our hearts to the Lord and worship. Amen. Praise is rising, eyes are turned.
The next song is based on Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Bless the Lord, O my soul, O my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O my soul, I worship Your holy name.
We just want to thank you for your sacrifice, for your suffering, so that our sin would be cleansed and that we could be drawn to you and we could be connected with you. We just thank you, Lord, for who you are, how you love us. We pray that we would come to you this morning just earnestly seeking your heart and to know more of you through your word. We just pray that your Holy Spirit will prepare us this morning and teach us. And we ask you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. The story is told about a pastor who was retiring, and on his final Sunday, he was saying farewell to his congregation and meeting them at the door for the last time. And he shook the hand of one elderly lady as she walked out, and she said, your successor can't be as good as you. The pastor, quite flattered, said, well, that's nonsense. And she said, no, really, I've been here under five different ministers, and each one has been worse than the last. You know, knowing there are people who could do your job better is both humbling and healthy. I love being a pastor, but there are plenty of areas where I see the giftings of other pastors and I think to myself, wow, I wish I could do it the way they do. I don't usually start a sermon with a disclaimer, but right at the outset, I want to confess that this final section of James' letter takes us into territory where I know others have more experience gifting and insight than me. I don't have all the answers. So this morning, I would just like to invite you to take a humble walk with me through these final words of James' epistle. Let's begin by reading James chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. This call to prayer at the end of the letter is not really unique to James. Paul often ended his letters with an encouragement to pray. Uh, for instance, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, Paul says, Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. Or Philippians 4, 6, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Or Colossians 4.2, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Or 1 Thessalonians 5.16 and 18, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now James directs his counsel toward two parties. First, there is the individual, and then there is the church body as a whole. Uh, verse 13, is anyone among you suffering? Let him, the individual, pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him, the individual, sing praises. Suffering prayers. You know, the past couple of Sundays, we've considered James' strong warnings to the rich and powerful who maintain their positions by cheating and oppressing the poor. And on the flip side, James had words of encouragement to the oppressed encouragement to stand strong and know that God had heard their cries. We all encounter suffering, don't we? It may be the suffering brought on by someone over us who is dealing oppressively with us. There are some terrible bosses. Of course, there are some terrible employees, and there's some terrible co-workers. And the suffering 
in those situations is real. Some of us are facing financial hardship. That's the suffering that we're experiencing. Others live with the pain of broken relationships or the passing of someone that we love. There are rebellious children and dysfunctional parents. The violence that we've seen in cities across our nation has been a graphic reminder that there are people who face hatred and persecution for everything from the color of their skin to the color of their uniform. Whatever the cause, James' counsel is pray. Prayer is the place that we get it out. Even if getting it out means sitting speechless in God's presence with the ache of our heart simply laid out before Him. Suffering prayers are not pretty prayers. Listen to King David. This comes from Psalm chapter 6, verses 2 and 6. David says, Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. That's how deep the pain goes. He says, I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. The Apostle Paul said that God himself enters into suffering prayer with us. Romans 8, 26. Paul says, The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Wow. Paul envisions Christians facing suffering so deep that prayer is rendered speechless. Sadness so deep that the lexicon of human language is insufficient to express it. Suffering so great that even the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, can only translate it into prayerful groans. But whatever you're suffering, and however deep it is, James says, pray. But of course, life isn't just about suffering. There is much to give thanks for. Over the years, I've been able to visit several areas of the developing world, places where there is great poverty, suffering, and hardship. But even in those places of hardship, I've encountered celebrations, laughter, smiles, James says, is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Our culture isn't so good at singing praise when we're happy. It's a good habit to learn. I once had the opportunity to travel with a team of doctors and dentists to Cameroon, Africa. Now, when Cameroonians celebrate, they celebrate. Beautiful robes and all. We ended up traveling on a bus for several hours into the bush country to a small village where we were to conduct a clinic. And we arrived long after dark, but as we pulled into this small village, there were children lining the road, cheering. As we got off the bus, the drums started up, and the singing and the dancing started, and, and a full-blown party went on long into the night. Well, why all the music? Because having the opportunity to see a doctor was a huge occasion to celebrate for these people. James encourages us to celebrate our blessings with eyes turned heavenward. And you don't need a whole village to have a party. You can host your own little mad party of praise. Shower singing is a great place to get it out. James then broadens his focus from the individual to the church body. And he returns to the issue of suffering, specifically physical sickness. James chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, they will be forgiven. Now, if you want to break this down to its most simple formula, it would go like this. If you're sick, call your church leaders. They will pray and you'll get well. Pretty straightforward, but maybe not so simple. Here is where I have to confess that I don't have all of the answers. Our elders have been asked on numerous occasions to pray over sick people. 
And we have done that. We are happy to do that. We have even anointed them with oil. But in all honesty, I have rarely witnessed anything I would consider an instantaneous, miraculous healing. So maybe we're doing it wrong. Not enough faith. Not enough elders. Not enough oil. I think there is more going on than just needing better technique. In fact, whenever people get caught up in techniques, I get suspicious. Techniques suggest that God can be manipulated by our actions or that he toys with us, waiting for us to get it right before he will act. Do you recall the story of the career criminals who hung on crosses on each side of Jesus as Jesus was dying? One of them, we're told, sneered at Jesus. The other, with his dying words, blurted out to Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. I would say that that was not good technique. But Jesus' response was the gracious assurance that his request was enough. Jesus said, This day you will be with me in paradise. See, God looks on the heart, not the technique. Here's the other problem with emphasizing technique. It easily turns prayer into a shame-inducing activity. If you're not healed, then it must be evidence that you didn't do it right. Uh, your faith wasn't great enough. I grew up in some circles where that message got communicated when miracles didn't happen. Is it possible to pray a meaningless, faithless prayer that God is not going to respond to? Of course. But to shame a person who has come to God on trembling knees because they didn't have enough faith is just wrong. Remember the story of the father who brought his spiritually afflicted young son to Jesus? We find it in Mark chapter 9. And, and this father comes and he says to Jesus, If you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. I think that's one of the most sincere prayers in the Bible. Guess what Jesus did? He healed his son. I think that James is making this big, bold statement about prayer and healing because he wants to drive home the importance of the body of Christ coming together to pray. And he doesn't want to dilute the message with a list of disclaimers. This letter is not the only teaching they've received, and the broader scope of Christian teaching and experience reminds us that physical suffering and supernatural healing is a multifaceted topic. Let me add some disclaimers that I think James and his audience were well aware of. And if footnotes or study notes or fine print had been a thing in that day, maybe James would have added some of this. First, James himself has already warned those who confidently make plans for the future, stating what outcomes they will get from this or that venture, that they err if they fail to factor in that God's plans may be different from theirs. In both our planning and our praying, then, we always have the same heart that Jesus had as he prayed to his Father in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not my will, but yours be done. Second, James and Paul knew each other well. Both of them had seen miraculous healings up close and personal. And yet Paul himself recounts having some physical problem, something he called his thorn in the flesh, that he says he had prayed very specifically on at least three occasions for it to be removed. And after his third prayer, he recounts that God gave him a very specific answer. No, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect, Paul, in your weakness. So in Paul's situation, God actually saw a greater purpose in not healing him. I don't think that James would have said to Paul, well, you just prayed wrong. Third, unless Jesus returns first, someday, 
all of us will leave this mortal plane because we will eventually die of something. Now, if James' words were a blanket guarantee that all sickness would be healed as long as you had the elders pray, then it would be conceivable to achieve eternal life on this earth. When Paul counseled Christians that when we face the loss of those we love, that we do not grieve as those who have no hope, we'd have to say that he missed the boat because if we just kept using James' formula, we'd never need to worry about grieving because we'd all get well every time. Fourth, Scripture talks about gifts of healing and tells of specific times and places when healing was especially evident. Here's an example from the earliest days of the church, Acts chapter 5. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. They even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. Now that was a very unique time as the power of God's Spirit moved in dramatic displays of power, helping to establish and launch this new community of believers. But it would be wrong to take that story and come up with some kind of shadow healing technique based on what happened with Peter. God worked in a unique way at a specific time through an individual he had chosen to uniquely use. The fact that this period of large-scale miracles is recorded as notable in the history of the early church also tells me that it's not necessarily normative. Healing is not a one-size-fits-all sort of phenomena. Paul speaks of healing as just one of many gifts the Holy Spirit imparts. He's also clear that God gives different people different gifts. And while we all have the privilege, even the responsibility, to pray for those who are sick, I would have to assume that those God has chosen to gift in the area of healing will see more healing occur in the course of their ministries than those not so gifted. The only gift qualification stated for elders is that they should be able to teach. Being an elder doesn't necessarily mean a man has a special gift of healing. Now, let me add some disclaimers to the disclaimers. A couple years ago, I took a rather daunting project to read through Dr. Craig Keener's two-volume treatise on miracles. Dr. Keener is a respected biblical scholar. He also believes that God still does powerful things. So do I. In his research, he recounts story after story from both historical records right up to the present of God miraculously healing people, many of these with detailed medical corroboration. A couple of weeks ago, I had the privilege of baptizing Kelly Merrickan. She recounted in her testimony that she was experiencing sickness at one time in her life, and a Christian in China prayed for her, and she was healed, before Kelly was even a believer. In fact, if you study the explosive house church movement within China, you'll discover that Kelly's story is quite common. In a land that was long closed to the gospel, God has revealed himself time and again by healing those who are sick. For Kelly, that was an important step in her moving toward God. I think that James was writing to people living in a similar time. God was actively healing as a key witness to this new good news message about Jesus. That's not to say God doesn't heal in our context. Some of you within our church family have told me of miraculous healings that you've experienced, and you're the kind of calm, reasonable people that I don't think are making things up. For the record, let me say clearly, that I believe God still heals people today, miraculously. I don't believe he chooses to heal everyone or to heal every time faithful people pray. Healing ministries raise red flags for many of us. They certainly do me. We have seen or heard of abuses, gimmicks, even fraud related to so-called faith healers. But that's not unique to healing. It's not even unique to Christians. Choose any sphere of influence and you will find abusers, gimmick pushers, and fraudsters trying to get a piece of the pie. There are people who start cults based around their Bible teaching ministries. But I still believe teaching God's word is important or I wouldn't be standing here. Why does God heal sometimes and not others at other times? 
Well, you'll need a better pastor to answer that. But someday, when we see him face to face, I think we'll understand. Until then, if someone is sick, we should pray and freely ask for healing. You know, sometimes you can tell just by the tenor of our prayers that while we're technically asking for healing, we really have already resigned ourselves to God's will. What we really mean is that we don't expect anything to happen before we've even allowed our heart's desire to be plainly laid out to God. Go ahead and lay it out. Ask. Don't worry, you won't push God into doing something he shouldn't. A quick word about anointing with oil. Some have suggested that oil was used medicinally and that what James is encouraging is for the elders to both pray and provide medical care to the sick. I think we absolutely should pray and provide medical care. But I don't think medicine is what the oil in this instance is talking about. Throughout the Bible, the act of formally anointing someone with oil was a symbol of God's Spirit resting on them. I think that's the idea. The oil serves as a physical symbol that God's Holy Spirit is present, hovering over, moving through, ministering to the sick. Our culture tends to be very cerebral in how we approach things. But symbols, the bread and cup of communion, the water of baptism, the anointing oil of prayer are powerful ways to remind ourselves, body and soul, of the spiritual realities that surround us. Interestingly, James suggests a possible link between physical illness and sin in a person's life. James 5.15, if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. In Psalm 32, King David records the physical suffering his secret sin of adultery brought him. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Doctors will tell you that many of the patients they treat are suffering more from sickness of the soul than they are sickness of the body. I read a book a couple years ago by Dr. David Levy, a neurosurgeon and a Christian in San Diego titled Gray Matter. In it, he recounts his experience of offering to pray with his patients. As Dr. Levy began praying with patients, he discovered their conversations often moved from physical issues to soul issues, and in particular, matters of forgiveness. He told of one man who came to him suffering from a small aneurysm and pain in his back and neck. And as they talked, it came out that this man carried a deep resentment toward a real estate agent who had gotten him into a subprime mortgage just before the market collapsed. And as a result, he lost his home and had to go live with his daughter. He was also angry at God because his wife of 48 years had died. Hearing of the anger and the resentment that was filling this man's life, Dr. Levy talked to him about his relationship with God. He prayed with him, and he led him through a process of forgiveness. Here's how Dr. Levy summarized what happened. This man who had been given many treatments, tests, and scans, and had spent many months looking for a solution to his neck pain problem, found relief when he released those he had not forgiven and was honest with God about the painful loss of his wife. I think Dr. Levy's care for that man lines up with Dr. James' prescription. James says, Therefore confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. Confessing to one another. That's an intimidating concept, isn't it? I have a certain persona that I like to project, and Tim the Sinner is not really the picture I'd like you to hold on to. But holding on to secret sin only gives it a greater stronghold in my life. So is James suggesting that we just blab our dark impulses over coffee with whoever may be nearby? Well, no, confessing is important, but so is knowing who to confess to. Find a trusted, mature Christian friend who loves you and can help you walk away from whatever it is that trips you up. I think it's best to find someone who is the same gender as you are. Men confess to men, women to women. 
And if your sin has directly hurt someone else, but they don't know yet what you've done, I would suggest you not start your confession directly with them. If porn has become a secret obsession, the first person to talk to isn't your spouse. You will need to talk to them at some point. But start with someone who can help you take the steps you need to take without being personally hurt by the knowledge of what you've done. That friend can then help you decide when and how to talk to the ones you've directly hurt. But note that James keeps tying this all to prayer. We engage in a conversation about our struggles and failures with trusted counselors and with God. James says that prayer is strong medicine. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. To make his point, he uses the prophet Elijah and an Old Testament story that would have been well known to his Jewish audience. In an act of judgment, God sent Elijah to the wicked Israelite king Ahab to declare a drought. Uh, there was no rain for three years. When God was ready to send rain again, it was only accomplished in response to Elijah's praying. It's interesting that James chooses that vignette to illustrate his point. There were certainly other, even grander stories from the life of Elijah, as well as other great figures of the Old Testament, like Moses. So why this one? Bible scholar Craig Blomberg suggests that this story in particular fit because Elijah's prayer for rain came in response to King Ahab's act of repentance. In other words, the sickness of drought that had settled over the land was lifted because of repentance. The story of Elijah is interesting too because in it, Elijah ends up praying multiple times before the rains finally come. It's a good reminder that while God listens to our prayers, sometimes the answers come more slowly than we might expect. The final counsel James gives his readers has to do not with restoring someone to physical health, but restoring them to spiritual faith. It seems to fit into this theme of repentance and restoration. Verses 19 and 20. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Sin may lead to sickness, but it may also just lead you astray, even away from faith. James encourages the members of Christ's body to not be passive when they see a brother or sister wandering into error. To lovingly intervene is to truly love. Well, that's the letter of James. It's theology with its shoes on. It's a reminder that what we believe needs to work itself out in how we live day to day. Because faith isn't just something we hold in our heads or hearts. No, real faith has feet.
Hello church, I'm Sean Stanton, the Adults Ministry Pastor here at DCC. Uh, I just want to thank Tim for that sermon and for taking us through the book of James over these last 12 weeks. Today's sermon concludes the book of James, and I think we can all agree that our understanding and appreciation for this book has increased greatly. I know mine has definitely increased. You know, I was raised in a very legalistic religion. The only thing I remember hearing from the book of James was in the chapter, in James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17, the gist being that faith without works is dead. It was actually one of the first verses I was taught to memorize as a small kid. The focus was not on faith, though, but on works. That scripture was repeatedly used to get us to do stuff. Unfortunately, my previous religion was not and still is not the only one that misses the point when it comes to works. Clearly, a true Christian will have works. James gives only a few examples of the many ways our faith is manifested through our actions. The Bible is full of accounts where faithful individuals were purely motivated towards some form of works. But true God-given faith is the key. Works are the byproduct of that faith. It's a cause and effect reality of our healthy love and appreciation for God the Father, the Son Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. By our faith-inspired works and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we bless God and others. Faith truly will have feet. The book of James provides much practical counsel that has value for us today. In today's sermon, James ends his letter by focusing on the necessity and power of prayer. And Tim did a great job of addressing the sometimes controversial topic of healing. In today's time of discussion and reflection, I thought it would be good if we just spent some time thinking and talking about the book of James in its entirety. Really, so many good things have been discussed. I will give you just a few words or themes that we've discussed from James to help jog your memory. Here are a few. Faith evident works. Patience and steadfastness. Warnings against worldliness and partiality. Humility and true wisdom. Hope and encouragement for the oppressed warnings to the rich and boastful, and the power of prayer. So try to look back. Was there some key point that the Holy Spirit impressed upon your heart? Again, these are just some helpful conversation starters. You may very well have your own highlights from this series. Maybe it's a new favorite verse from James. And that's how I'd like to end our time, by sharing with you my favorite verse from James comes from James chapter 1, 17 and 18. It says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to the change. Of his own will he brought us forth by his word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. What encouraging words for these challenging times. Okay, well, I hope you have an enjoyable time of fellowship and prayer. I'll see you next week. Have a blessed day.